Hello and welcome to Talking Live. I'm Dr. Robbie Ludwig here in Star Shop Studio in Times Square. Today we are talking about a very relevant topic. It's called The Gray Divorce with Dr. Jocelyn Crowley, who is also a professor at Rutgers. And we had the opportunity to work together. We did, we did. Before then, um, you reached out to me to do a blurb. I was like so excited to Oh, meet I was you. thrilled that you would do it for me. And um, then we had an opportunity to work together and become That's friends. Fantastic. So, so basically, we were talking about this very relevant topic and it's a topic I knew a little bit about mm -hmm. just from, from writing work. about yeah. the, the midlife mm -hmm. space. So here we have The Great Divorce and we are also going to have information about where you can get this book but what we want to tell all of our Facebook friends and viewers is that of the people who share the show, we are going to be choosing who gets a free signed copy. A lucky winner. Of this book. <laughs> um, so share the show and, and you will definitely be in the list of potential winners to Perfect. get a signed copy. Okay. So before we get into this topic, yeah. what is the gray divorce? So a gray divorce is simply a divorce that takes place between a couple where one member of the couple is age 50 or older. Mm -hmm. And it's been a phenomenon that has been growing in time. Um, over the past couple of decades, the gray divorce rate has actually doubled. Right. So one out of every four gray, uh, divorces now is gray in the United States. So it's, it's a really important social trend. Um, yeah. The divorce rate for the population overall has been stabilizing in the United States. So for this rate to really, really pop up, um, is something that we want to pay attention to. Yeah, it's quite striking. And I would notice that just in terms of my own friend group, mm -hmm. people getting to you know their 40s and 50s and all of a sudden saying, this relationship is not right for me. And what I had mentioned to you is that a lot of the people I know, mm -hmm. it's, it's the women who initiated the divorce in, in many of these cases. But we'll get to that a little bit sure, later, sure. later on. Okay, so... Why do you think this is happening so much now? Well, I mean, I think there are just a couple of social trends that are going on. Mm -hmm. So we just have the aging of the baby boomer generation. So people age 50 and older, there are more of them. So, you know, in 2010, there were about 100 million. By 2050, we expect there to be about 161 million um, people. So just with more numbers, you're going to have more divorces. In addition to that, people are just living longer. So yeah. used to be the case in 1950, the average man lived to about 66, the average woman 71. Mm -hmm. Now the average man lives to 76 and the average woman leave, lives to 81. So they're living longer, a growing chance that they'll be exposed to having a great divorce. And I also think that just divorce overall has become destigmatized. People don't look at it as a bad thing anymore. Yeah. They look at it as, you know, if this is something that I really want to do, there's no shame in doing it. Right. And I guess, too, if you know a lot of people that are getting divorced, mm -hmm. you know, I guess that can make it easier. But you know, what you found in your research was similar to what I found in my research. People are living longer and they're living younger longer. Yes. So they're at this healthier space, 50 and beyond, and they ask themselves the question, you know, am I happy in this relationship? Do I ever see it changing? And for the people that say no, then feel that they're young enough to still enjoy another relationship. That's right. And, and some get lucky and, and sometimes, you know, not so much. What got you interested in the topic? I know you mentioned we have a picture of your grandparents. Oh, let's hope, yeah. Oh, well, that, there's, that, there's Alan. We'll get to that. So, so Jocelyn was married to the wonderful Alan Combs, and we'll talk a little bit about that later. Many of you know yes. him and were fans of his. He was on Fox News with Hannity and Combs and then had a very successful radio show right. until his untimely death, very young. Yes. Um, but we'll get into that a Absolutely. little bit later. Absolutely. So those are your adorable <laughs> grandparents. How cute are they? The, you know, it's, yeah, the, 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 those are my grandparents, uh, Florence and Stanley. Um, and um, they lived until their 80s. And, you know, I was lucky enough as a child to spend a lot of my summers living with them in Massachusetts. They lived in southeastern Massachusetts. Were they your mom's parents? They, were my, they were my mom's parents. Okay. And, um, you know, they fought like hell. 
They were they were married for 68 years, but they fought like hell, you know, over like ridiculous things like, you know, did you where's my pants or where did you do the dishes or go get go to the store and get me milk, you know, but they never ever talked about divorce. So, you know, when I started to learn a little bit about these statistics about gray divorce, I thought to myself, this is something I really, really need to study because it's not in my experience at all. So, you know, they gave me a really good model and when I heard about all of these other people breaking up, I had to understand why. Do you think there's a component of the grass is greener on the other side? Mm -hmm. Or maybe, you know, I think previous generations mm -hmm looked at marriage a lot differently mm -hmm. and one of the things that's changed over the years especially in the 70s mm -hmm. it became kind of the me generation yes and so yeah. what we wanted out of marriage was something really really different yes than people yes. expected to get in you know a previous generation yeah. so it was this idea that the other person i marry will be the perfect person and will help me achieve great heights and will meet my emotional needs and just be everything to me or just that all in one kind of person. Mm -hmm. The reality is, you know, you're a flawed person and well, you I'm not a flawed person right, and you're, you're not, not a flawed person. But, you know, it's, it's reality, <laughs> We're both perfect. Right, yeah. Right. Um, I'm sure people who know me might be able to tell you something different. But basically, you know, the truth is it's two flawed people yes. that are together and a misunderstanding of what we can get out of marriage or what we expect to get, I think also contributes to divorce. I don't know if that's what you found also. Absolutely. Well, there is this idea, yeah, from the 1960s, people really, it was a changing social time and people thought, you know, I really need to develop myself. I need to be self-focused and marriages started to be a lot more about, is this marriage going to help me along the road of self-development? Um, and so I expected with all of the people I interviewed for my book, and I interviewed 80 people for my book, 40 men and 40 women who had experienced a great divorce, I expected that the majority of them would say, oh, I divorced for these reasons. I divorced because I you know, wanted to find myself. I fell out of love. We grew apart. That was true for some of them, but not the majority of them. The majority of them really looked at these classic reasons for divorce and um, such as adultery, the kinds of things that we commonly think of and that was the reason why they separated and got a divorce. Did you find that there was a different reason for men initiating a divorce and women initiating a divorce? Yeah, absolutely. So there were some common reasons. Um, men and women both talked about growing apart, which is the 60s thing, um, and then men um, and women also talked about adultery and they talked about the mental health of their partner, that whether that partner was diagnosed by a physician or not, they worried about their mental health. Then there were also important differences between the sexes. Men talked about or complained about the way things were being done in their household, so they didn't like the way money was managed. And they thought that, for example, their wives were spending too much money, like, oh, here comes the credit card bill and you just spent a thousand dollars in a purse and I didn't know that and yeah. I'm really angry. Um, also the men complained about... And know, this was even if the women worked? Yes, yes, yeah. yes, very, yes, interesting for a whole host of reasons. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, and the men... we need those pocketbooks, The pocketbooks Sorry. are essential. I let my own issues get in the way. That's you okay, I am a big fan of the pocketbook, you know, yeah. and so to me that would be a good <laughs> treat. Um, but the men didn't like it as much. Yeah. Um, and then they also complained, they seemed to hold on to a lot of anxiety and anger about the way their children were raised. Um, so they, they often complained, now most of these children were now adults, um, and so they complained about the fact that their wives weren't as focused on discipline as they wanted them to be. That's interesting. It would Especially linger. Since their kids had reached adulthood. Yeah. They, held on to that. they held on to it. Um, women, on the other hand, um, talked about two issues that the men didn't talk about. So for women, one key issue was addiction. And I'm interested to hear what you have to say about this as a psychologist. Um, women talked a lot about pornography addictions, alcohol, and drug addictions. For some of the pornography addictions, um, it was that the women found out that their husbands were gay, just due based on their pornography habits. 
Um, alcohol just um, constantly was tearing marriages apart. Um, one woman I spoke to said, you know, we were in the restaurant business together. In the restaurant business, there's a free-flowing uh, capacity or supply of alcohol. And he would get drunk every day. And I just got to my breaking point. And then lastly, the women talked about verbal and emotional abuse. Um, their husbands calling them names, horrible names. I hate to even repeat, but they're in the book. Um, also, um, if the woman brought in children from a previous relationship who were still minors, a lot of these new men um, were very controlling over the children. And one of the most disturbing stories was with this new man who came into the marriage, and he thought that that woman's daughter was overweight. So um, he padlocked to the refrigerator. Uh, so that's a little bit, as a psychologist, you would probably think that that's a little bit out there. Well, one of the things you know that can happen with a second marriage mm. is that what makes it so hard to survive second marriages is that you're bringing your stuff, yes, you know, into yes. this new marriage, and so kids sometimes can be a factor or a source of, of stress. And I do hear that a lot, both in my private practice and just anecdotally yeah. about a woman. Yeah. She was married, um, you know, again, this is a woman who was very well healed. She married this very good looking artist mm -hmm. and beautiful kids. And for some reason, the husband and the kids did not get along. Okay. And it became so argumentative and problematic mm -hmm. that it basically ended the relationship. Now, I'm sure that there were other issues. Sure, but sure. So, you know, everything you are saying mm -hmm. from the drug addiction to the verbal abuse, mm. certainly these are stories that I hear a lot oh, about. It's sad. So this generation maybe has more financial opportunity right, to right. say, I don't need to stay in an abusive situation. That's right. That's right. I think we're giving both men and women permission to get out of an unhappy relationship, which might not have been a message in the past? I think so. I think there's a lot more freedom to get out right yeah. now, um, even in the face of some really stark consequences. Um, you know, once you break up, you know, marriage is, marriage is good for a lot of reasons. And, um, and a lot of that has to do with finances. You're pulling your finances together. You're pulling all types of resources together to create this happy home. So marriage is good in a lot of ways, and, but the marriages in, this, in these cases were so bad that it was worth it for them to exit the marriage. And we'll get into the consequences, but yeah. I want to just mention a little bit, because you have not really been on the air to talk about Alan and your right, relationship right. and writing this book around the time yeah. that you were married and we have a picture of you and there we Alan. are there you are <laughs> so beautiful and i was fortunate enough to work with alan on hannity and combs we didn't work together on uh -huh. the radio show uh -huh. but just always such an elegant lovely decent yeah human being. and just was. a pleasure to be around you know you know when you're around a refined Person. Oh, that's so sweet of and you to so, say. And um, so I kind of felt like he was looking down on us with approval, yeah. but we were together. I don't know. That could be my I, own I like that. I like but that I idea. Really felt like he approved of us working together. I, I, I'm, um, yeah, no, I, I agree. You know, he. Um, yeah, that was that. I think that was that at some type of Fox event that we went to. And then I think the other in front of the Christmas tree was that at the White House. Yes, that was at the. There was yes, yes. Yes, that was in 2015 at the White House Christmas party. That was um, before he got sick. So you know he um, he had lymphoma, and it was aggress an aggressive type of lymphoma. And um, so from diagnosis to death was only um, five months. So it was very, very hard, and he passed away in February of 2017. Um, ooh, ooh, we can't lose the merchandise. No, 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 no. All right, okay, here we go. Um, so, you know, it was, it was very, very a difficult time. You know, he was a fighter throughout it. He um, got off television for a period of time just due to appearance issues. But he constantly went to work every day, and he did a three-hour radio show. Wow. While Even when he was diagnosed. When he was diagnosed, when he was going through chemo, you know, I would wake him up at 4 o'clock in the afternoon, and he would say, I need to do this. And he would go, and he would do his three-hour radio show, and he would come home, and he would sleep. And, you know, he took so much joy out of his work. You know, in, in radio and in television, it made him so happy. And the other thing that I think he put a lot of effort into was 
He's, he was such a beautiful person. Yeah. He didn't want me to worry. Yeah. And so I think he did a lot of things to sort of protect me from really knowing how bad he felt sometimes, you know, like physically um, as well as emotionally. He put on such a strong face and he had so much courage and I, so you know, he was really protective of you. He was, he was, he was. And yeah. I, I dedicated the book to him yeah. and, um, you know, uh, he, you know, he, w he was just an amazing husband. And, and I always tell people I was very, very lucky to be his wife. That's what I say. And he, I'm sure, felt so extremely lucky to have you. And it's just such an interesting topic to write about mm -hmm. when you're dealing with you know, being a widow. I right? know, and, I know. And whatever your feelings are about these people choosing to divorce. It Did was, that change your perspective at all? You know, it's really interesting. A lot of people said to me when I started to write this, he was still well. So I started to write this and people would say, are you guys okay? I'm a little oh. bit worried. Are you writing a book about divorce because things are rocky? That's what people would say to my husband when I was <laughs> writing about marital homicide. They're like, are you guys Oh, that's okay? hilarious. Are you guys okay? Are you afraid of your wife? He's like, as a matter of fact, I am. <laughs> so, yeah, no, so I got, I got some of those comments and I said, no, no, we're okay. I'm just, yeah. this is, these are the kinds of issues that I write about. Um, but it was difficult at the end when I was going through the editing process and you know, reading people's stories about separating and then also at the same time going through my own loss yeah. and feeling of loss and feeling like sometimes I wanted to go back to these couples and say, please give it one more shot. Right, because you were experiencing something yes. that you had no control over. I had no control over and it. here they are choosing yes. a scenario yeah. which would induce loss, but they did have control over it. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. So, so in that sense, there was some difficulty, and then of course, writing the acknowledgments. You know, he was he was so supportive of my career um, as an academic. You know, it's, we are very different people in terms of him being in the media world and me being in the academic world. But he was so supportive of everything that I did, the books that I wrote. That you know, he would read my teaching evaluations. Oh, I love that. <laughs> and also, you have a very supportive sister too. I do. I do. We're going to get to the quick five in a few. That's where we ask you some questions, but oh. um, yeah. we're at the 90 Second Street Y, we yeah. had Monica, who was just a supportive, she was wonderful um, sister, just like supporting you and clapping and, and there to honor you. Oh, she's, she's, she's an amazing sister. And, you know, even through Alan's illness, you know, I was telling you before that, you know, he would be at the hospital and if I needed to teach, she would sit with him from morning to night. Before we close on with a couple of, of, of statements about the book, mm -hmm. you said that there were some social consequences yes. for both men and women that were slightly different. For yeah. the women, what were the social so, consequences? So for women actually had more economic consequences. So women after a great divorce um, experienced a lot of financial insecurity um, because they had taken time out to raise their children. They hadn't saved enough money. So when they got a great divorce, they were really concerned. You know, a lot of them ended up saying that they became more frugal, they had to rely on their parents for money, um, and they also had to, um, just a couple of them said, I have to work till the day I die. Men, on the other hand, had these social consequences, and the social consequences were basically that their wives had put together their social lives when they were married, and once they lose that wife, they no longer have a social life. So that was a significant loss for them as well. So the takeaway from the book you're hoping I'm hoping that you know people will read these stories, and in many cases they're very, very sad. But at the end of the book, they talk a lot about the hope and happiness that they have going forward, and the optimism that they have going forward, and um, and the willingness that they were open to getting remarried. Most of the most, most of the men, most of especially the men, <laughs> especially the men, because <laughs> they know how how uh, they'll get their social life. That's, right, that's right. That's <laughs> right. Before we close, we'd like yeah. to do something called a quick five. So I'm ready. We, I'm ready. We get into some uh, serious questions. Okay, go okay. ahead. What's the closest thing to real magic that you've experienced? Um, experiencing the the presence of Alan um, oh. after he passed. Yeah. Him, yeah, him yeah, feeling like he's around. Oh wow. So nice. Do you still feel that? I feel that, and you know, he. I feel his presence, and that's the closest thing to magic. Oh, I love that. 
What's the most interesting What's thing you've read or seen read this week? Ah, read or seen this or week. Seen this um, um, I actually saw I, Tanya, oh. a movie. <laughs> I, I, it's, um, it, it's an incredible movie. Um, I remembered what happened. So, you know, it was great to see. And it's a fantastic movie. Go see it. Good. Okay. I'm putting that on my list. When you're having a bad day, what do you do to make yourself feel better? Um, I usually turn on the Property Brothers. I like home and garden wow. television. <laughs> the process of renovating. I know nothing about renovations. The process of them taking, like, a crappy house and like turning it and making it into a mansion is very therapeutic for yeah. me. It's hopeful, right? It's, it's hopeful. certainly a hopeful message. It's hopeful. What's your best childhood memory? Spending time with my grandparents. You know, they, they spoiled us rotten during the summers that we spent up in around the Cape Cod area. Spending time Such with them. Beautiful area too. Gorgeous, gorgeous. And they loved us to death. What is a sound that you love the most? Oh, that's easy. Beach, uh, the sound of waves at the oh, beach. Very calming. Idea. Almost as good as Xanax. Yeah. Probably. Can I say Without that? Without the side effects. Without the side effects. Yes, you can say whatever you want. <laughs> we are so thrilled to oh, have you. Oh, thank you, you so thank much you for, for having me. your knowledge. Of course. And just your experience. Of course. And you know I adore you. And I adore we had you. we so much fun working together. We did. And everyone, really, get this book. It's fascinating. And it reads like a, a novel in, in terms of the stories that are in it. Very relatable, great resource. We'll have access to a link so people can find it and so people can find you and find out great. more information about you and some of the other books that you've written. Perfect. Thank you so much for joining Talking Live, and we'll see you again next week.